Um, I'll, our speaker this evening is Peter Llewellyn. Peter is a member of the Wildflower Society and has been for many years. He's the current chairman of the Wildflower Society. He's a man of many talents in how he's contributed to the Wildflower Society. He's been our webmaster for, I don't know how many years, but about 15 uh, years. He's been the webmaster. He's, he's written, maintains, uploads, everything to do with the website at, at present. He's with a couple of others from the Wildflower Society. He manages um, the Facebook site for the Wildflower Society. And he also has his own web website, which is called UKWildflowers.com, if you're interested in some excellent uh, pictures. On a sort of more personal level, he is a lifelong Manchester City supporter, which will warm him to some people and perhaps not to others. So he's a lifelong Manchester City supporter. And he is a member of the founder member, founder member in fact, of the 92 Club and the 38 Club. We could have a competition to if to find out if anybody knows what the 92 Club and the 38 Club is, but to put you out of your misery, 92 Club is the number of football league stadiums, uh, stadiums, grounds in the football league in I think England and Wales. So Peter has been to them all. The 38 Club is the number of stadiums in Scotland, and he's been to all of those. So, briefly, he is a pie expert. He can tell you which to go to for the best pies. Okay, Peter, over to you. That's great. So, I think we're on. Well, hello everybody, and welcome to this talk about my struggle to find the Snowden lily. I wonder if when you started to take an interest in wildflowers, you did the same as I did and started to look through all the books that you got and became a bit fixated on one or two of them for no apparent reason. For me, it was uh, Scottish primrose, Primula scotica. Um, the bird's eye primulos, uh, Primula farinosa, the yellow star of Bethlehem, Gagea lutea, and the Snowden lily. And there was no rationale behind it. I just liked the looks of the pictures and I really wanted to see them. And of those, really, the Snowden lily was the one that was the most likely for me to find because it so happens that Snowdonia is only about two hours from where I live. However, you read about the Snowden lily and of course, it's actually very rare. It's on about six sites in Snowdonia, and it really is mostly found on uh, mountain ledges. So knowing that it's in Snowdonia isn't terribly helpful. You really need a little bit more guidance. So I started asking around with a few botanists that I knew to see if anybody could give me some help in where to start looking for the Snowden lily. And fortunately, I found uh, a few people, I think there were three of us, who said, well, not only have we seen it, we actually know where it is, and if you like, will take you to see it. And that was uh, a, a decision. So we actually set the date. And in those days, because I'm talking quite a long time ago, the date which we used to set was around about June the 6th. And the reason why you've got to be careful with that is the Snowden lily is quite a short flowered species. If you leave it for about three weeks, um, it will probably have gone over. So if you, if you start, if you hope to see it in July, you'll be very, very lucky indeed. So anyway, what they said was, we're going to a place in Snowdonia called uh, Cum Idwal, and uh, I had never heard of it. Uh, I, it, it. It's very familiar to me now, but in those days, I'd never heard of Cum Idwal at all. It's a hanging valley, and it's actually uh, very attractive, not only to people who are interested in botany, but also to uh, mountaineers, because... Um, the mountaineers like to climb many of the, um, the, the slopes that are nearby, including one called Idwal Slabs. 
And um, people like to come here for just an, um, a, a day out in the summer. And a lot of geologists come out. You get parties from Bangor University because this is an absolutely superb example of a hanging valley. So this is the place to come. And the idea was we would come and walk around here all the way up these slopes, go to the cliffs, go to the back of the cliffs and find the Snowdon Lily. And they knew exactly where to go and they knew exactly what to do. What they didn't tell me was that Kumidwal is absolutely a terrific place to go to see all kinds of plants. And actually it's well worth a visit even if you aren't going to search for the um, for the Snowdon lily, because there's so many different habitats. The rocks there, for instance, are basic and acidic. There are little mini caves in the rocks which attract um, woodland plants. Of course, they're the subalpine and alpine regions. And the lake itself, Flinerdwal, is a, a pristine, pure upland lake. And so it's got plants growing in it as well. So really, there are a lot of different habitats and the plants occupy those in a, a wide range. And in, indeed, there are some real rarities, including at least one which is every bit as rare, if not rarer, than the Snowdon lily itself. So where is this place? Well, this is a, um, a, a Google Earth picture taken from the opposite mountain, Penir Oliwen. And this here, this area here is the Kum Idwal. All that remains of the glacier, which was here about 12,000 years ago, is now Llyn Idwal. And what you can do is to walk up this path all the way around. And they said, well, we'll be going to these cliffs at the back. And here's a close up picture of it. You go along here, along this path, right up through these rocks, all the way around the back. And they were very clear that this was the best place to see it. They say it is actually on all these cliffs here. But as I will show you, the vegetation is quite thick there, so it takes quite a lot of seeing. So that, that is roughly the, um, the, the, uh, the route that we're going to take to start with. But it's going to be a bit idealistic because I'm going to show you pictures of plants from all times of year. So you could never take one journey there and see them all. And the first snag with visiting this place comes with the fact that the parking right near the beginning is actually quite limited. So if you start at the ordinary time that Wildflower Society meetings start, round about 10 o'clock, you've got very little chance of finding a parking space. But there are parking spaces a little bit further up the road. And I think when we went first, we had to use one of those um, and then walk to what you might call the starting grid for our uh, trip around uh, Flynn Idwell. Well, that was no great hardship because there are plants near the big lake at the bottom, um, which are well worth seeing. For instance, Snowdon, as you probably know, Snowdonia is a very wet place and the, the rain falls down the hills all over the rocks and it cascades onto the rocks that are quite close to the road, providing little marshy areas which are pretty well wet all the year round. And this uh, little violet here, which you might recognise as being the marsh violet, Viola palustris, with its kidney shaped leaves and beautiful markings on the, on the petals here, was growing only two feet from the pavement that we were walking along. And that's on the mountain side of the road. On the opposite side of the road, there are some dry stone walls. And at the right time of year, you could be lucky in finding what I regard as the most beautiful of the St. John's Worts. This is slender St. John's Wort, Hypericum pulchrum, with its shiny triangular leaves. And it's almost uh, deep yellow, almost orange flowers. Hypericum pulchrum. Pulchrum, of course, means beautiful, which is a very apt name for this plant. As well as those growing um, quite close to the, the uh, pavements on either side, there are little grassy patches which stick out into uh, Flynn Ogwin. And it's worth having a look at those because they do contain at least one rather small, uh, rare British plant. And it's here with its blue bell-shaped flower and leaves that look exactly like ivy, you wouldn't be surprised to find that this is called the ivy-leaved bellflower, Wallenbergia hedericea. But it's very small, you have to tread carefully. Look for by the side of it, here's a blade of grass. So you can see you could easily tread on it when you were looking. And there's another small plant quite close to it too, which you can find, and that is the smaller of our two skull caps. The larger one is blue, but this is the lesser skull cap, um, Scutellaria minor, with its uh, very small tubular flowers, reminding you a little bit of a miniature foxglove. This is quite a wet area. Um, 
not not wet underfoot so much, but as what you might call a damp meadow. So you're not terribly surprised to find amongst the taller plants that grow there is one that's very um, familiar to everybody, I think, and that is the meadow sweet, Philippendula ulmaria. Well, you walk along the road to the starting place, and at the at the starting place there are various buildings, and behind those buildings there are some of the rocks which are part of the mountains of Kumidwal, and on those rocks at the in late summer. You can actually find growing um, and in flowering are three common heathers. So there's uh, Erica tetralix, the cross-leaved heath. There's ordinary heather, Coluna vulgaris. And we also get a lovely show of bell heather, uh, Erica cinerea. And that's just, if you like, at the start. Once I got familiar with Kumidwal, I used to take um, Wildflower Society trips for people to see the plants just around um, the, the coom itself. Um, but I always warned people that if they wanted to get a parking place just at the bottom there, they would have to come early. It will start the meeting at 10 o'clock, I said, but it's no use coming at 10 o'clock for a parking place. Well, one chap took this to heart and he came very early around about eight o'clock and so had some time on his hand and went exploring at a place that I haven't actually looked at before, which was the outfall of Flynn Ogwin. So when I arrived there, he said, I found this funny looking yellow plant that I don't recognize. Would you like to come and have a look at it? And this is what it was. Well, I couldn't name it straight away, but I did recognize that straight away it was a hawkweed. Now I'm sure uh, people will be familiar with these. Um, there are about 480 different hawkweeds. So they're a bit of a specialist plant to identify. At first, it reminded me of one that grows in Slendidno with its blotchy leaves there. I thought it might be the rare Welsh hawkweed, but on examination I could see that it was actually hairy and the Welsh hawkweed is completely glabrous. That means to say it's got no hairs whatsoever. So I took the picture and hawked it round to the various um, hawkweed experts who eventually focused in on what they thought it must be from its description and its location. And it turned out to be the Carneth hawkweed, Hyracium carnethorum. Now, the little R's by the side I've taken here are usually from New Flora of the British Isles by Professor Clive Stace. And he has three ratings for the rarity of a plant. If it's just rare, he puts a one R. If it's very rare, it gives two R's. If it's really very, very rare and you're extremely unlikely to find it, it gets three R's. Well, he can't really put them in for, um, for the uh, hawkweeds because there are 480 of them and it would make his book something like 10 inches thick if he did that. So he's just put a few in and I've guessed what he would give here. So that's what that means. It's very rare. It only grows in this part uh, of North Wales and nowhere else. Well, there are plants near the lake itself. So if we climb up now from this area up to the lake, uh, we can have a look at here, this is Thinigual, and now this is a view which goes down alongside the A5, um, the mountain from which we took the photographs to start off with, and Flynn Idwal. And the idea is you walk up this path here, along here, along this little shingly beach, and you start looking for plants all the way along this path here and up on the cliffs. And then eventually you can make your way back all the way down again. If you were to do that in the morning and go for a walk all the way around, it would easily be completed in the morning. As long as you don't have any botanists with you, because as we know, botanists can sometimes take an hour just to get out of the car park. So, start along here and then along the side of the lake itself. And this is what the lake looks like in summer. And you can probably see just about make out that what we've got here is people enjoying themselves. These are not botanists, geologists or mountaineers, they're just people who've come out for a nice day um, in, uh, in North Wales and they're sitting by the side of this beach having their picnics and having a paddle in this rather shallow lake. The deepest it gets around about 10 feet. Of course you'd always have to remember with these upland lakes that they only have really two temperatures, uh, freezing and very very cold. So a lot of people have got caught out by these when they try to go swimming and get into a bit of trouble because they're a lot, lot colder than you think they are, even though the weather can be very hot in midsummer. This lake's got quite a lot of uh, mud at the bottom of it, which supports plants growing. And all this area in the foreground here 
is mostly water horsetail. But if there's been a, a storm on the, uh, in the previous week or two, then what you can sometimes find on this Shengli beach is a plant that's been blown up from the 10 foot area because it actually grows at the bottom of the lake. And that one is this quillwort, Isoetes lacustris. Um, so what I did when I found this one, it was blown up on the shore. So I stuck a bit of rock and underneath it to make it look as though it was actually growing. But it was uh, really, it will only be growing like that at the bottom of the lake. And to take a decent picture, you'd have to have an underground camera, an underwater camera. If you walk along the side of the lake and keep peering in, you will see uh, a plant that's quite uh, uh, a bit unusual. This is, the, this is a photograph of it taken uh, obviously through the water, which is why it's all blurry. But you can see the little white dots there. Uh, they are actually the flowers. And this is one of our Britain's rarities, the allwort Subularia aquatica. And Subularia aquatica flowers underwater. So this is about as good as you get if you only can see the plants growing under the water. Um, but very occasionally uh, we get long periods of dry, warm weather and the lake shrinks a little bit. And if it shrinks at exactly the right place, it can leave one or two of these plants stranded uh, on the mud. And so you can get a better picture like this. It isn't a spectacular plant at all, but it is a rare plant of our upland pure lakes. And so it's well worth looking for. Uh, very close to this one in high summer, there are many stands of a plant which does look really rather nice. And that is the water lobelia, lobelia dortmana. Difficult to photograph. And here I'm actually standing in the lake in my wellies photographing towards the shore uh, because it has uh, long red stems and a few bright blue flowers um, up the stem. Um, and really it's mostly stem, but you, you do see it um, and it does look really good when you see um, 20, 30, 40 or 100 stems all together in the water. Close up, you can see it's got a typical lobelia shape to the flower. Now, as we walk past the lake now, um, there's some what looks like little hills and they're actually moraines left over from the Ice Age. And uh, underneath um, these moraines, often there's slabs of rock which um, stop the drainage from being any good. So you've got little mini peat bogs growing there and plants of, that typically grow in peat bogs have started to colonize those areas, including this one, which is quite a famous one because um, it's uh, our, one of our commonest insectivorous plants. This is the round-leaved sunew, uh, Drosera rotundifolia. And you've probably seen the various documents about this one, how uh, a fly or an insect will come and settle on the leaf. And once it's done that, it's doomed because it can't get away from these sticky glands. And eventually the leaf closes around it, exudes digestive enzymes and digests the fly. And the theory is that the nutrients it gets from the insects that it digests supplement the rather meager diet it can get in the poor soils of a peat bog. And typically when I read this, it said they, they provide extra nitrates for the plant. What uh, I didn't know until I visited is that although we've got a few Drosera species in this country, in Western Australia, they've got dozens. They've got uh, climbing ones. They've got tiny ones with little red flowers. They've got ones with very big pink flowers. And they all have the same characteristic. They've always got these kinds of leaves with the sticky ends. So they're catching insects. But there, they're not growing in damp peat bogs, not in Australia. They're growing in quite dry soil. And what the Australian botanists say is they're doing the similar thing though. They're catching the flies and the insects to supplement their diet because the soil there is hugely deficient in all, um, uh, all nutrients, including phosphates. And they're after the phosphates as much as they are with the nitrates. So I guess that's probably what all Drosera do. They take the insects and they take whatever nutrients they can uh, because the area is so deficient. So that's the boggy area. Uh, we walk away now and leave that and start to go on the path. And this is what the path looks like as you go towards the rocks. Here it is going there, threading its way through there. And from this perspective, these rocks look sort of moderate size. They're actually very big. Uh, these large ones here about half the size of a bungalow. So if you're going to examine the flowers that grow under and on and on top of that rock, it can take you as much as half an hour. 
So we go along here and we start looking out because there are still things to see along the side of the path, including one plant which was introduced to us um, in the very first video on uh, Lindisfarne. And that is the butterwort, Pinguicula vulgaris. And when you approach um, a little colony of butterworts, the first thing that strikes you is actually the bright green leaves before you perhaps notice the blue flowers. And when I first saw it, um, I tried to find one which didn't have any um, leaves spoiled by the little black dots, which I thought were dirt or soot or something like that. Because at that stage, I didn't know that butterwort is also an insectivorous plant. And those little black dots weren't soot, whatever. They were actually insects that have been caught by the plant. And here's a close-up of the leaf. Here's a bit of a green fly and a thread. And these tiny little dots on the leaf here exude sticky stuff, which traps the insect and the leaf falls over. And again, they get digested and it provides extra nutrients. That is not a spider. It's a bit of a root. So that's the, that's, uh, the pinguicula. And by the time you're seeing that, you're now quite close to the rocks. And one of the points about those rocks is that although the rain falls on top of them, uh, providing moisture for anything that's going on the top, an awful lot of it flows underneath the rocks, keeping the underneath part uh, very wet and damp at uh, all times of year. So any seed that falls down the cracks in the rocks ends up by being in damp uh, or wet soil, can germinate and send its shoots up into the sunshine, just like this lady's mantle. We don't get any of the alpine ladies' mantle in this area, um, Alcamilla alpina, but we do get this, which is smooth ladies' mantle, Alcamilla glabra, without any hairs on it. Alcamillas are quite difficult to identify, and you usually use the shapes of the leaves and sometimes something about the flowers, but the flowers, to me anyway, look much of a muchness. It's still worth looking by the side of the path because once you're in those rocks, you're in the subalpine region, and you can see uh, sometimes one of our three commonest club mosses. Um, we have stag's horn club moss here, we've got fir club moss, and we've got this one, which is alpine club moss, Diphasiastrum alpinum. And the thing we always have to say when we're leading our trips around here, club mosses are not mosses. We have a number of plants that we misname in English. Club mosses are not mosses. We've got saxifrages that are not saxifrages. And uh, we have things like um, grass of Parnassus, which is not a grass. But the next one I'm going to show you definitely is a grass, but it's a bit unusual because this grass went to seed. And instead of dropping its seeds onto the ground, the seeds sprouted when they were actually on the grass itself. So that by the time it was maturing in late summer, it had a head full of little seedlings, which then drop onto the ground and have a start in life and can do a little bit of photosynthesis towards the end of the year. And this is an example of vivipary. And this particular plant is known as viviparous sheep's fescue, festuca vivipara. I only find this occasionally, it is there, but you've got to, be, you've got to hunt for it. Um, and it tends to grow sort of slightly hidden away uh, where other plants now are much easier to see because they can grow right on the rocks themselves, including this, which <clears throat> when I first saw it from a distance, I thought, oh, perhaps that's one of the saxifrages. Well, it isn't. This is actually the spring sandwort, Sabulina ver verna, used to be called Minuatia. And to my surprise, when I looked it up in uh, New Flora of the British Isles, it turns out to be a British rarity. And the reason why it's a surprise to me is because I do a fair bit of botanizing in the White Peak near, uh, near Buxton area in Derbyshire. <clears throat> and that's famous for old mines. And whenever there are mines, there are spoil heaps. And those spoil heaps are full of heavy metals, which are poisonous to quite a lot of plants, but not to spring sandwort. <clears throat> spring sandwort really rather likes those. So if you go to a place like Cressbrookdale and you walk along um, in the right time of year, you can actually find huge numbers of these clumps of a spring sandwort, which is a bit of a puzzle when you read that it's rare. But this is a feature sometimes of our rarities. You can find something that's nationally rare, but actually is locally frequent. It isn't locally frequent here in Comidwal. It's here on 
it's here and there on the rocks and you do have to look for it. Close to this one too was something that sometimes fools people because they think it's the maidenhair spleenwort and it's related but this is actually the green spleenwort, Asplenium viridae, and it has a green rib all the way down the middle. This is called the rachis, and this green rib stays green all its life, and that's it. That's the reason for its name. Um, as you can see, it sprouted in the dark, damp crevices of the of the rock here, and that allows quite a lot of plants to grow that uh, wouldn't necessarily you wouldn't necessarily associate with rocky areas. And perhaps this was the next one I'm going to show you is one of the best examples of something that to me was wet, looked as though it was way out of place. This is um, opposite lead golden saxifrage, which isn't a saxifrage, Chrysosplenium oppositifolium. And the reason why it's doing so well is because underneath that big rock, it's exceedingly wet indeed. This is a plant that likes to grow uh, next to streams and ditches, or even on tufts of grass right in the middle of streams. It really does like to have its roots very close to or actually in water. So to find it growing in rocky habitats seems a little bit puzzling, but that's the reason why. It's got its feet in water and its head in the sunshine, and that's a particularly nice specimen, I thought. Uh, on, the, on the rocks too, there's a plant which is illustrated in some of the, um, in, in some of the buildings down at the bottom of Kumidwal. And because it's illustrated, people go to look for it. Uh, and this is the purple saxifrage. And the commonest thing I hear people saying about this one is that they can't find it. Apparently they say it's common, but I can't find it anywhere. Well, it is actually reasonably common at Comidwell, and I know the reason they can't find it. And the reason they can't find it is because it flowers much earlier than you think. If the winter has been mild, this will actually start to flower at the end of February, and it'll certainly be flowering by the middle of March. By the, I don't know, by mid-April, most of the um, purple saxifrage on the rocks has finished flowering, and you'd have to look much higher up um, to, to see it flowering. You can still always find this in flower on the highest mountains. So, for instance, if you were at the top of Ben Laws, which is around about 3,900 feet plus, it will be flowering in the middle of July. But here, heights of what 1500 feet or so no you've got to go early to see this and that's why people miss it and they miss it uh, and they miss sometimes one of the most spectacular manifestations of it because it will actually flower in the snow a little bit like the alpine snow belt so you can find these bright orange answers and purple the picture of it like that yet uh, and i'm not sure that many people do but uh, there you are so that's our purple saxifrage, and not terribly far from the, the, the where I took this photograph is one of Britain's rarities, and that is the tufted saxifrage, Saxifraga sespitosa. And this is an Arctic alpine. So this grows in the Arctic regions um, and on tops of mountains in Scotland, and it's not common even in Scotland. So it's a triple R rarity. And the speciality of Arctic alpines, of course, is that they can tolerate any cold, uh, any cold weather at all. So if the winter were to get down to minus 20 or minus 30, it wouldn't bother the tuftest saxifrage in the slightest. It can cope with any amount of cold. What it can't cope with is competition. So as the climate warms, the more vigorous plants start to move uphill and begin to occupy the little niches in the rocks, the ecological niches, that were the uh, place where the saxifrage grows. And I have to say that I haven't been able to find this on the rocks in the last five years, which is exactly what the warden predicted when I spoke to him about 10 years ago. And he said, in a five, he said to me then, in five years time, he said, this will be gone. And we get quite a number of comments about that. And you read about it in the newspapers, how our alpines are moving uphill to extinction, because eventually if the climate is warm enough, the vigorous species will grow towards the top of our mountains and will take over all the uh, habitats of our, our alpines, which won't be able to compete. Quite close to this is another rarity, which you do find again in, uh, in, the, in the high mountains of Scotland, and that's the alpine saxifrage, which is now Micranthes nivalis. And yet again, this was on the rocks and I haven't been able to find it in the last few years. Uh, beautiful dark green leaves with purple on the side, and when it's in flower, it looks like that. 
So that's the Alpine saxifrage. It's still on the cliffs, it's still high up. So it is possible to find it and it's still possible to find the, uh, the tufted saxifrage as well. But it's one of those things where you're saying, if you want to see these plants, look for them now. Perhaps in 20 years, they won't be with us. Well, under the rocks, as I mentioned, you get these little mini caves. And so it attracts um, uh, plants that like the wet and the damp. Typically, here we've got wood sorrel, Oxalis acetacella, and that's growing in, in fairly deep shade in this one. And if you, if you ever got that sort of deep, damp shade, you can look out for ferns. And there are all sorts of ferns on Kumidwal, and I haven't really got space or time to show you any of them, but I'm going to show you two, the first of which is my favourite, and that's the oak fern, Gymnocarpium dryopteris, which I think is a beautifully delicate little fern, and one that you could easily say, yes, I wouldn't mind having that in my garden, actually. So that is not difficult to find at Kumidwal if you start looking in between the rocks at these crevices. And to contrast with that one, which is a particularly beautiful one, the next one I'm going to show is particularly not beautiful at all. Um, I don't think I'll go so far as to say it's ugly, but it's bordering on that. And here it is. These are little strands of moss growing by the side of it, and that's the fern itself. And this has the unusual characteristic of being able to disappear to almost nothingness if the weather gets too warm and it's deprived of uh, moisture. And then as soon as it rains and it gets wet again, it springs back into life as though nothing had ever happened. And this is one of our filmy ferns, Wilson's filmy fern, our Hymenophyllum wilsonii. By the time you've found this one though, you're very close to the cliffs. And the cliffs, the goat cliff, has devil's kitchen. And often you'll find people on, um, on the internet and things, it says the devil's kitchen, Tulti. Well, actually that doesn't translate as devil's kitchen, it translates as black hole. And that's quite an apt description because when you look at it, there's a huge black gash in the, in the cliffs and you can't see through it. You can't even see into it until you get right up to it. it there's rocks at the back, so it is completely dark. And the myth is that if you see smoke rising from the devil's kitchen, which is mist, of course, if you see smoke rising from the devil's kitchen, stay away because the devil is cooking his dinner. Well, we went up to the cliffs and had a look and there are plants growing on those cliffs from a distance. It doesn't look as though there's any vegetation at all, but this is an example of it. Um, Latheris linifolius, a uh, bit of vetch and wood anemone growing there as well. But perhaps a good example of what it's actually like there is a small patch of the cliff here with all its vegetation. And they call it the hanging gardens of Kumidwa. And just to point out something here, here we've got whole loads of rose root, Rhodiola rosea. We've got trolius here, these, these plants growing here. We've got a cushion of moss campion, some uh, Uzula, uh, Sylvatica, a great long strand of dog's mercury going all the way there, a wild rose, and this little purple job in the middle, that's an early purple orchid. So there's an awful lot of different plants growing on this cliff, and some of them are quite tall. Now bear in mind the Snowden lily is actually quite a small plant. So my friend said, well it's really, it does grow on there, but you've got to hunt for it and it isn't easy because you'd be you'd be sort of really straining your eyes to see um, one tiny plant uh, amongst all this vegetation. So he said it's much better to go around the back where there's less vegetation and it does grow on the ledges. So we went around the back, up past the cliffs, around the back to this sort of area. Now we didn't go to this actual place, this is just typical of the sort of place that we went to. And this is actually the very back of the devil's kitchen itself. And then our leader, took out from his bag a pair of binoculars, which surprised me somewhat because I thought he was going to take me to see the plant close up. And he said, no, we can't really get there. It's on the ledges. So we'll have a look through the binoculars and see if we can find it. And uh, the experts who'd all seen it before and knew exactly what it looked like, they scanned the rocks and very quickly, they said, oh yes, there's one there and there's one there. And they looked round and they showed me, they gave me the binoculars and I had a look through. And all I could really see were, that I was familiar with was wood anemone and, uh, and wood sorrel. And the Snowden lily really looks 
from a distance quite a lot like wood sorrel, but in any case, we were looking for a white flower in amongst white flowers. So they had a look again and tried to find one where it was more prominent. And eventually they settled on one ledge where they said it was all of them agreed. It was definitely there in the middle, uh, left, left of center in the middle of that ledge. And they started to describe it in that way that birders do when they want you to find a bird in a tree. They said, look, can you see the branch sticking out of the rock? Well, follow the branch to the end, to the red bit. It points down to another bit of jagged rock that looks like Mick Jagger's nose. If you follow that to the end, there's a ledge and the, and the Snowden lily is in the middle of that. So I looked at that and we all confirmed that we were looking at the right place. And yes, there were white flowers, but I couldn't be absolutely sure that what I was looking at was a Snowden lily. And they looked again, they said, it's definitely there. It's definitely there in the middle. If you're looking at what we're looking at, you've seen the Snowden lily. So I really had to accept that, that yeah, that was the Snowden lily that I was looking at. It was in with all these other flowers not quite what I expected. So it was a bit like Schrodinger's plant. I'd both seen it and not seen it at the same time. And it seemed to me that we'd had a really good day botanizing, but actually the one thing that I wanted to see wasn't really as close at hand. I know if we hold wildflower society meetings and you say you're going to show somebody a plant, they do expect to be able to get reasonably close to it so they can see the markings on the petals and what the sepals look like and what the leaves look like. And I couldn't really make those out. But we'd achieved our objective. We'd sought the Snowden lily and I'd seen it. And so that was the end of our trip to Kumidwal. And we went back down again. We were at the back here somewhere. We went all the way down here, round through the rocks, down this sloping part here. And the only tricky bit actually is this bit because this is a stream that comes down to feed feed the lake and uh, if it's been raining the night before heavily that can be full of water so it could be actually almost impassable and to give you a clue of what it looks like this is what it looks like on a good day when there's not much water in it and it can go quite high as you can see only one person can cross at a time the path stops there and you have to climb down and get over and it starts again a bit further up and that's my wife Heather struggling on her own with me just watching so we went all the way back down and we went back uh, having sought and seen the Snowden lily. And that's really as far as I got in those days. Um, I had joined the Wildflower Society, so I went on many of their meetings. And one of the great things is if you go on a, a good variety of Wildflower Society meetings, you go to all sorts of different habitats. You'll go to chalk country, you'll go to limestone country, you could end up by, um, in the Cairngorms or anywhere. You see so many different habitats to find flowers. And in doing so, you improve your identification skills. And gradually, bit by bit, I saw the flowers that had, I fixated on in those early days looking through the books. In one of the early Wildflower Society meetings that I went on, um, I was shown the bird's eye primrose, Primula farinosa, at gate barrows. And I am pleased to say that's a good news story because I went back there only a couple of years ago. And now there are even more bird's eye primroses growing there than there were when I saw them in the 1980s. I'd searched for the Yellow Star of Bethlehem for many occasions and never found it. Eventually, I was given a, um, a site in South Cheshire, which is quite close to home, and it was a very good one. So I found that uh, plant, which is another very early plant in flower. It will actually be in flower now. And eventually, I made the long trip to the north coast of Scotland. And the north coast of Scotland, of course, um, is the place where the uh, Scottish primrose grows. And although it does come south a bit, it only really comes south as far as Wick. It, it likes Orkney, it likes the North Coast, it'll grow on Shetland. But as far as it's concerned, Inverness is in the equatorial south. But I did find it because when I went there on spec, I asked some of the locals and they told me to look for it along the coastal path of Durness Golf Course. And this Durness Coast Path is actually one of the best botanical sites in the country for a special reason, and that is that the seasons are compressed. So this was actually growing alongside ordinary primrose, Primula vulgaris, which normally would be completely finished anywhere else in the country. But in that part of the year, it's out in summer along with the Scottish primrose. And you get marsh marigolds out at that time of year, which would normally be over, and you get cuckoo flower uh, in flower. But also you get orchids and gentians and all kinds of wonderful plants. It is 
At the same time, one of the most inaccessible, but also one of the best botanical sites in the country. But what was missing from that was a close-up of the, of the Snowden lily. So I started asking around again, and eventually I found a chap who, who definitely knew where to find it, close up where I could photograph it and look at it and study it. And I told him about my experience and he said, well, you don't really want to go to Kumidwal to look for it. He said, it's there on the cliffs, but it's hidden amongst all the other vegetation. You'll confuse it with things like uh, a wood anemone and, and, uh, and, and wood sorrel. I said, oh, tell me about it. That's exactly what happened. He said, in any case, it's called the Snowden Lily. Where would you want to see the Snowden Lily, but on Snowden where it was actually discovered in the first place? And so I said, well, how, how, tell me, where can you get it? He said, well, I'll give you simple instructions. He said, it's straightforward. Park in Llanberis, there's plenty of parking place there because an awful lot of people are going up to the top of Snowden on the train. Find the Llanberis path on your map, follow it all the way along. You'll be walking along with all the Snowden conquerors and eventually they'll start to go up a steep slope to your left. You carry on and in front of you, there are some huge gray cliffs and it's on those gray cliffs. And then he said something which sends the chills down the spine of anybody who's looking for a rare plant. He said, you can't miss it. So I took him at his word and I went along to Flanberis and parked the car, found the Flanberis path, walked the way along, found the cliffs and found quite a few alpine plants. And did I find the Snowden lily? Yes, I did. It was exactly where he said. And so from then onwards, I was able to take people from the Wildflower Society um, on trips to see the Snowden lily right up close where they could photograph it. And the last time I did this was in 2018 with uh, three other friends. And uh, we had a really good day. And uh, now I'm going to show you some of those pictures that we saw on that day, including the Snowden lily. I actually described this uh, trip in our magazine number 505, um, just this trip on in 2018 which was the day after the bank holiday and the bank holiday had hordes and hordes of people going up Snowden and uh, the crowds were just as uh, big on the next day when we went when it was extremely hot and although we didn't know it at the time because we left them behind apparently there were so many people going up to the top of Snowden there was a queue and they actually had to queue and take turns to go up to the top of Snowden, take a picture, and then walk all the way back. To give you a clue how far this is, my pedometer said it was about 20,000 steps. And you don't need to be much of a mathematician worked out that if there's 20,000 steps altogether, 10,000 of those are uphill. So we went along, I went along there, and this is the sort of thing we saw. Well, at the side of the road, it's well worth looking out for quite a common plant. This is the Welsh poppy. And the reason why I, I would suggest you look out for it is because most of the time you see it, it's an escape from somewhere. But in this part of the world, it's actually native. And it's now not Mechanopsis, Mechanopsis cambrica, but Papaver cambricum. And there are other nice things. This part of the Flanberis path is tarmacked. So you're looking at the sort of verges at the edge, things like the Heath Speedwell. But really, this is where it stops. By the tarmacked area, you can see some quite nice plants, nothing rare, but once you get into the mountain part of the Flanberis path, you're accompanied also by sheep and they've chewed everything off. So you'll see the occasional heath rush. You might may find a foxglove or a, or a milkwort somewhere, but an awful lot of the plants that might have grown in that area have been eaten by the sheep. And so it's a bit of a botanical desert as you're walking along and you walk along eventually getting to the cliffs, and eventually leaving to the, the, um, the, the Snowden conquerors behind. And as soon as you leave them behind and go on the path towards the cliffs, you begin to see upland plants like parsley fern, Cryptogramma crisper. This also grows at Kumidwal. It has sterile plant, it's got sterile leaves and fertile leaves, but this is almost in every nook and cranny when you get there. So it's quite a common one. Uh, as we were going last time, um, Peter Jepson, who was with us, uh, saw a big rock up to our left, which I hadn't noticed, and he bounded up to go and see if it had got anything interesting on it. Once he got there, he shouted us to come along, and it's a good job he did, because it was the finest example of moss campion that I've actually photographed. And this one had particularly long flower stalks, 
uh, making it look really rather nice. And I think this is such a, a lovely photograph. I've used it as the cover for both the Facebook page and for our YouTube channel. So that's Moss Campion, which is actually a British rarity, Silene acaulis. A little bit further along the path, you see some more alpine or subalpine plants, including one of the club mosses. This is looking like little Christmas trees. This is fir club moss, Upersia salago. And uh, um, now the, the ground starts to slope down from the left, down to a lake, which is on your right. And uh, you get little rivulets, little streams and wet flushes. And in those wet flushes, you can find this one, possibly the most difficult plant to photograph that I've ever come across. Um, it doesn't have any petals. It's got anthers sticking out on very, very delicate filaments. So the slightest breeze will cause the whole thing to shake. So if you're a photographer, I guess what you do is you, you wait for the wind to stop and you approach it, get your camera ready, and then you hold your breath because if you breathe out, you will actually make the plant move. This is the alpine meadow rue, Thalictrum alpinum. And it's a very nice plant, but I've never managed to get a, uh, any picture that's much better than this because it's always moving whenever I see it. Not far away from this in a similar flush, was a very good example of another saxifrage which does grow at Comidwell, but I thought I'd show you this one because it's such a good example. So this is the starry saxifrage, Micranthes stellaris. And when I'm going in upland areas, I always look out for this because once you see this growing, it's like an indicator plant that you're in alpine regions and there's usually plenty of it. Now we're right up at the cliffs themselves and you can see the nature of the path that we've come across here. And you can see how it goes on sloping ground for quite a long way. At first it's on the flat, but now it's slopy and stony. And you can probably understand now why if I've advertised this uh, as a trip, but it's raining on the day, I won't actually take people up because to have uh, everybody picking their way through these rocks on rainy days is a little bit lethal. It would be easy to turn your ankle or worse. And you're quite a long way from Clanberris. But this was a dry day, it was a sunny day, and we turned round to the cliffs to look for typical alpines. And of course, this is one of the commonest ones you'll see, rose root close to Rhodiola rosea. For a long time, it was sedum rosea, but now it's gone back to the name that I knew when I first started botanizing, uh, Rhodiola, because that's what taxonomists do. They mess around with the names all the time. Very close to this and in reasonable quantity too, is another of the British rarities in, rarities in its southernmost station in the British Islands in the British Isles is northern rockcress and little clumps of white all over the cliffs here, Arabidopsis atrea. And the rarest one of all is actually not the Snowden lily, I'm sorry, on Snowden. The rarest one on Snowden is not the Snowden lily and I've never seen it. But Gwyndaf took a different route up the cliffs and then climbed a little bit and found the Arctic mousia, Cerastium nigrescens. And you find this in uh, you find this in the Cairngorms, for instance. But here, it's there's probably only twenty or thirty plants left by reputation, so it's actually exceeding rare indeed. If those here look to you a little bit like sea pinks, that's because that's exactly what they are. Sea pinks actually quite like the mountains, and they'll grow in the mountains just as well as they'll grow by the seaside. But we came to look for the Snowden lily, and if you look round, you can very quickly find them often by themselves without any plants um, uh, concluding the view. And that's a distant view of a Snowden lily with its long grass-like leaves here and the lily itself. But we were in luck because um, this Snowden lily um, is actually at photographable height. And we found this quite a few. I think we found about three or possibly four that were in flower um, just about three or four feet off the ground and quite a few leaves of ones that hadn't flowered that year as well. So this is what the, the Snowden lily looks like. And it, it used to be called Lloydia serotina because it was discovered by Edward Lloyd um, in the 17th century. And he didn't see it in flower. I think he saw it in fruit and uh, he recognized it as being something completely different. And he took a sample with him, which has got a little bulb on the end. And uh, he, uh, he published his findings in one of the journals. And so in honor of his discovery, which was, I have to say, some quite significant botanical feats since we're right at the very beginning of the study of botany, 
uh, it was named after him. So it was called Loidia serotina. And then the taxonomists came along and said, well, it isn't that, it's actually a kind of Gagia. So it has to have its name changed to Gagia serotina. Taxonomists are some of the finest party poopers in botany, really, because really it should have been named after uh, Edward Floyd, who was the discoverer. Very commonly when you get to these cliffs, you've been walking in the dry, but the plant itself is, has, has had mist around it for most of the morning, and so it can often look like this with rain dropped all over it. But it still looks quite pretty, I must say, um, but it's a very wet area, so you shouldn't be surprised if you do find the flowers, but they've got raindrops on them. Now, you've probably heard from the other videos that we've had that although it's very rare in this country, Flynn Jones pointed out that it's not rare on the continent at, at all. And, and it isn't. You can come across it. If you go botanizing on the continent, you can usually find in the hilly areas, you can find Snowden lily. And here's a picture of it in the Russian Caucasus. And this one shows you the beautiful purpley brown markings on the underside of Snowden lily. Um, and that one, I think, uh, will probably be um, fertile and, and reproduce with seeds. I don't know whether ours actually do that. I think they reproduce vegetatively, but there are plenty of these. And this is just growing in an ordinary alpine field, not amongst rocks at all. Flynn pointed out that it's very common in Switzerland. And if you go walking in the Engadine, you can easily find uh, plenty of Snowden lilies growing alongside other plants as well. And here is the Snowden lily growing in the Engadine in Switzerland. And you can see there's about a dozen white Snowden lilies growing there altogether. So it really is quite common there. And nobody really makes a terrible uh, a fuss about it when you find it in Switzerland. It isn't one of the rarities that they're going to show you. But as far as I'm concerned, the point about the Snowden lily for British botanists is seeing it in the habitat where it was once discovered, seeing it on Snowden itself. And once the chap had described this to me and I'd actually gone there for that first time, I was able to tick the Snowden lily properly off and not just look at it as a diagram, but look at it as a plant that I was able to study and, able, and, and photograph. And from then onwards, I've been able to show people the same thing. And I think it is, although it's a very small plant and not a terribly significant plant, nothing like a lady's slipper orchid or anything like that, there's something special about finding one of our rare plants in the, in the original habitat that it was discovered all those years ago. Well, our group there, we're all very pleased with their find. This is the 2018 uh, Snowden Conquering Group with Peter Jepson on the left-hand side there looking as though he's going to lead a trip around the Serengeti. Um, here's Sheila Wynn in the middle who hadn't seen it at all. She's our general secretary, me with the two stakes, stakes and our secretary of our local Natural History Society, Roy Beecham, who had actually got the site from me before and gone up on a day that turned out to be miserable and wet and so the flower was actually very poor indeed and he couldn't get any decent photographs. So he came with us and we're all smiling because we came on spec, we didn't know it was going to be there and it was actually brilliant. So that was the story of my seeking the Snowden Lily and I hope uh, you have enjoyed it. And if you do find it, good luck and good hunting. Thank you. Well, uh, thank, you very, thank you very much, uh, Peter. Uh, now, if people can uh, have questions to ask, can you uh, type type them in? Uh, but while while you're thinking of a question to ask, uh, I've got a question, Peter, which I, I'm sure uh, people will be wanting to ask and perhaps ask now or later. Uh, are you going to give us any directions to the Snowden Lily? I'll I can give directions to people who are in the Wildflower Society or people who can be vouched for uh, by members of the Wildflower Society. But I know a lot of the local people around Llanberis and in North Wales don't want us to publish the exact details. That's why I've been a bit vague about where it is you actually find it. Although it isn't clear from what the way I described it, there are huge numbers of cliffs where we go there. So you really do know to know where to go if you're going to find it. And I think if you're a member of one of our botanical societies, by definition, you're interested in and value our wildflowers. So I don't mind giving you the precise instructions. 
So in, in that case, people can either, so they have my, my email address, or if you've got your Wildflower Society uh, magazine, I'm sure you can know how to contact Peter for that. Uh, Peter, the, the chats here seem to be things like, uh, thank, thank you, Peter, and uh, the, you know things like that. Uh, uh, Richard says, I was privileged to be on the meeting. <laughs> I think we've seen your picture, Richard. Which first? Oh, oh no! Which which first identified the bog orchid in Comidwell? Oh, we didn't see a bog orchid tonight. I I mm -hmm. have I have seen a bog orchid in a bog, and I got very close up and personal with the bog in order to find it. Well, I would very much like somebody to show me where it is because I was actually told where it was. I hunted high and low and couldn't find it. <laughs> So I would really like somebody to take me to Kumir well to show me the bog orchid, which would be quite oh, well, that, that, you, so there you we'll, are. we'll make a date, Peter. Okay. <laughs> uh, oh, Charles Whitworth says, oh, very nice photos and talk. When does the Snowden lily flower, says Charles? Uh, now, I didn't mention this, and I should have done. Uh, in, the, in the old days, when I first started, we used to say, um, go on June the 6th because it will have just started to flower so you've got the right sort of time not now go May the 28th and I think actually that Janet and Gwyndaf went the week before and yes. found it in flower so it's probably in flower from about May the 22nd uh, onwards but you do need you do need to take notice of those flowering times because I said it's got a short flowering period probably only three weeks so you you do need to make sure uh, so in short try May the 28th Okay, well, I, th I think everything else is very entertaining and lovely. Excellent talk. Thank you. I, th I think you must have answered everybody's questions, Peter. So can I say on behalf of the society and behalf of all these many tens of people who've been listening, thank you very much for that talk. And um, can I say to people that it will, it will be, before too long, it will be up on the uh, YouTube channel, the Wildflower Society uh, YouTube channel so that if you want to look at it perhaps before you go on a trip to to Snowden or Comidwell or to remind you of a trip to Snowden or Comidwell that you've done before I have to say having been to both places on many occasions the absolutely gorgeous brilliant places to go